All right, grab your Bibles. Find Revelation 15. Several people asked, so I do want to share a couple of pictures from the uh, Israel trip. Uh, Jack Bowen and I did go to Israel, and uh, that's Jack right there. He's um, been over to Israel a little more than 40 times, I believe. He actually spent a semester there at Hebrew University as well, so it was awesome just to rent a car and drive, you know, expedited tour of Israel. It was really amazing. But um, we do want to plan a trip, but a couple of places that stood out to me. One is Caesarea Maritima. This is an area right on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, And you can see there's a hippodrome that they've uncovered there. That is a place where they used to race chariots. And there was uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, spent at least two years in prison there. That power plant probably was not there at the... (laughs) But that you could see there. But um, yeah, it was really awesome to be there and just kind of imagine the clap of these horses and chariots running around there and see the Herodian uh, architecture and that's preserved. And just to think, like this, you know, they were here. And uh, another place uh, that stood out was the Sea of Galilee. Um, There's a couple of little towns, but, you know, just to, to be there on the sea, a lot of the places you go to are you know, commercialized, and there's stuff built all over it, and you're like, okay, I guess, you know, this is interesting. But to, you know, to see the actual water, the Sea of Galilee is like, man, this is where Jesus calmed the storm, you know? There were, so much ministry happened along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and then that's Tiberias, and then also on the Sea of Galilee is Capernaum. In Capernaum, they've uncovered a, uh, an old synagogue, and uh, from Jesus' time, and you, you know that Jesus was there, you know. It's just really amazing to sit there, read the Word, um, just dwell on the, the just really the, the place to being in the Holy Land, right, and being right. You can see the Sea of Galilee in front of you, and you're, you're sitting there in these uncovered ruins, and they still a place to, to uh, enjoy there. There's a little bit of a discrepancy over where the tomb was at. The a uh, Catholic church has the place, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, that they uh, have built a large cathedral on and, and sort of commercialized it, and they say this is Golgotha and a tomb. Uh, but in the late uh, 1800s, there was a discovery made of a garden and both uh, the, uh, the place where this tomb, for example, is right next to a cliff that looks like a skull, and it's certainly most likely Golgotha. So this is a tomb. They're not 100. That's Golgotha right there. You can see the eyes on the right. That's just a picture I took. It's uh, the place of the skull, or in Latin, uh, Calvary. Right. That's why we where we get the word Calvary. Um, but right next to it is this tomb, and there's a garden area. You can go in the tomb, and you know it hasn't been built up or anything. It's not just commercialized. I mean, of course, there's a bookstore, you know, where you can buy trinkets, but it's. But other than that, there's not like, you know, you can sit there in, a, in the garden and enjoy uh, just the thinking about the, the cross and the resurrection. And uh, Jerusalem was definitely amazing to walk around. I can't go through all those details. But um, um, one other place I wanted to point out this morning was when we first got there, we headed down into the desert area, the wilderness down by the Dead Sea. And you go a little north on the Dead Sea and you come to a place called En Gedi. En Gedi is, if you know your Old Testament, it's a place where David spent a lot of time and where he probably wrote, where he did write several psalms. And as he writes there, he was, one of the times he's running from Saul, if you know the story in 1 Samuel, he's running from Saul, Saul's trying to kill him, he goes and hides in the caves. He wrote several psalms there, and Psalm 57 is one of those psalms that he wrote there in En Gedi. En Gedi is sort of a trail you can go up, and there is a a waterfall, right in the middle of the wilderness, in the desert, there's this place. There's these caves, waterfalls, and greenery. And you can just imagine David being there, um, just stressed out, you know, crying out to God for help, and uh, writing some of these psalms. Uh, and there's so many different places like this, in the rocks and the caves and stuff. So it's just really amazing to go there. Again, open your word, uh, read the scriptures. But I just wanted to read part of Psalm 57 to us this morning because it really kind of goes along with uh, the main idea in Revelation. But Psalm 57, just imagine David stressed out, uh, you know, seeking the Lord and 
uh, just hiding from danger. In Psalm 57, uh, picking it up in verse 1, I'll just read a few verses. It says this, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. And then he says this, one more verse, verse 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. You know, and I love that because David here is in great danger. He's in a very tough place in his life, and he's still seeking after the glory of God. You know, we see in Revelation, as we come to here, we see them ask a question. They ask this question, who will not glorify God? And the martyrs, it's a vision of martyrs in heaven, and they sing this song and the music of martyrs, and they ask this sort of rhetorical question like, why? Who in their right mind, right, knowing what they know, seeing what they're seeing, would not Fear God, would not glorify God. And that question has been kind of stuck in my heart this week. You know, at first I wanted to kind of go through, because we're coming up into the seven bowls of God's wrath, and it's pouring out the wrath upon the earth, and that's what we'll see as we kind of go along into the coming chapters. But this song, this music of martyrs, it just stands out to me this morning. And, you know, I've been asking myself, that question and asking God, like, why is God so good to us? He should sweep us away with the wicked. I'm a sinner, right? Why is God so gracious and why is he good? And like, who could just reject God and his, you know, his goodness? And this is really a fascinating question in, a, in an interesting section here. We see sort of this collision of the wrath of God with the grace of God. There's this you know, the violence of his wrath, but the goodness of his grace. So read along with me. Look at Revelation 15. Verse 1, it says, Then I saw another sign in heaven. Some of the visions that John has are in heaven. Some of them are on the earth. We get sort of a glimpse now into heaven. There's a vision of heaven. He says it's great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So these seven angels are handed seven bowls, and they're going to go and they're going to pour out the wrath of God. And it's much like uh, some of the plagues on Egypt. There is scorching fire from the sun. There is sores on people's bodies, sort of these plagues that come upon the earth because of God's wrath. But it's the last, it says, these seven plagues are the last. That is the Greek word eschatos. If you've ever read a systematic theology book, you know the study of last things is what? Eschatology. That's where we get that, that study. This is the last of God's wrath, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So there's these seven last plagues. It's going to end with the bloody battle of Armageddon. And I think we've all heard of that. All right. Verse 2, he says, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. The sea of glass, you remember, was mentioned in chapter 4. It represents the nations, and it's mingled this time with fire. Some commentators would say this fire is because God is a consuming fire. That's one of his descriptions. It's one of his names. It's mentioned in Hebrews. But he sees this vision, and also, notice in this vision, there are those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. So if you remember back to chapter 13 of Revelation, 
we read about these particular people. There was a beast that rises up on the scene. This beast is still yet to come future tense, we believe. The beast represents what the Bible calls the Antichrist. It's a world leader that's going to rise up and have sort of an economic system. There's going to be a mark that he requires the world to take. There is a religious leader that requires worship. But there are a remnant of people who do not give in to the worship of this beast. They, in fact, were martyred because of that. That's who John gets this glimpse of. They are beheaded because they wouldn't take the mark. And it's interesting that, hev- that heaven sees them as conquerors. Did you notice that? They, were, they are the ones who conquered the beast. You know, anytime that you don't give in or don't give your allegiance to Babylon or the world system, anytime you deny yourself of sin, you live for God instead of the world, whether it's peer pressure from those around you, you are a conqueror in heaven's eyes, which is very interesting, isn't it? The Bible says that you are more than conquerors. I love that verse. More than conquerors through Him who died for us. Going on there, look at verse 3. And they sing, that is the martyrs, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O God, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So there's these martyrs singing two songs, if you caught it. It says, one, they're singing the song of Moses, and then they're singing the song of the Lamb, and then they give us the lyrics for this song. Now again, he begins to go on into the pouring out of these bowls of wrath, but these lyrics are awesome. These lyrics are amazing. And I've been thinking, and I was kind of pondering, okay, what is the song of Moses? Some commentators would say that this is two songs into one, but I think they're definitely singing the words and the lyrics of Moses and also this new song, this song of the Lamb right here. So the song of Moses, if you're taking notes, there's three places that the Bible speaks of a song of Moses. Exodus 15 is one place, Deuteronomy 32 is another, and also Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is a a really a great psalm. It's the psalm of Moses. He wrote, it's when we get our uh, hymn, I'll Fly Away, comes from there. One of my favorites. I was just singing it the other night. But all, all of these songs have really three themes. As I went back and was reading them and thinking through this, there are three themes to all of these songs, and one theme is God's deliverance. Anytime the servant of the Lord, if you are serving God, you know how important God's deliverance is. Moses, for example, they were trusting God and they saw the hand of God deliver them from Egypt, from Pharaoh. They were slaves. They're crying out to God and they're singing and celebrating that God delivered them. A second theme in here, which is important, is God's wrath. So often these songs in the Bible, and if you are a godly person and you read the Bible, you understand there is many times a place and a good time for God's wrath. Like, for example, they sing, they're happy that Pharaoh's chariots are you know, thrown into the Red Sea, right? And the water just covers them over. They celebrate that, that God destroyed the enemy. That's a good thing. But also in these psalms, We see God's worthiness in all of God's interaction with His people. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of worship. I just thought we could read, just turn to Exodus just for a minute. Let's read a portion of one of the Psalms, the Songs of Moses. And you see sort of these themes. Exodus chapter 15. I heard many more pages turning in the 9 a.m. service. I'm not here. You guys must be digital, I guess. <laughs> Exodus 15. You can see the title there is The Song of Moses, and you see these themes of deliverance, 
of the wrath of God and His worthiness to be praised. Exodus 15, verse 1, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is the strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Phariots, Phariots, Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the, in the Red Sea. The floods covered them, and they went down to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. And then I love verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Who is like you, O God? So we see these themes of God in the life of Moses. And we see these believers, this music of martyrs, singing this wonderful song, just praising the Lord and saying certain things. So go back and think back again to Revelation 15. They sing this song of Moses, the servant of God, and they sing the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. That's verse 3. Just and true are your ways. Who will not fear you, O Lord? So just for a minute, I want to dwell on this glorious song and some of the things that these martyrs sing from heaven. You know, the Bible does this. It puts life into perspective, doesn't it? to think about these people that have suffered and died for the name of Christ. But there's four stanzas I want to point out this morning. The first one is this, stanza number one, those lyrics right there, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Right? You can summarize it like this, how marvelous is the omnipotent God, the Almighty. He is powerful. God, He is powerful over creation. His works are glorious, right? You look at creation. You look at the flowers. Like my daughter has these beautiful sunflowers growing. It's like, how glorious is the Lord? You see this beauty. The, the planets and stars that are in the sky, it's like you see His marvelous hand. You know, He marks the boundaries of the ocean. He's caused the sun to rise, the planets to be in rotation, if you will. Great and amazing are His deeds. He holds sway over everything. You know, but of all of His creation, the greatest of His works is what? What is His greatest work? It's the work of salvation. It's the work of Christ to come, to die, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for our sins. That is the greatest work. And you know these martyrs are thinking about the work of Christ on their behalf. Philippians, turn over there with me. It's just such a beautiful description of the work of Christ, of salvation. Philippians chapter 2. This is the incarnation of Christ. This is God Himself taking on flesh, setting aside His own prerogative for you to come to earth, to die for you, to be your Savior. I love this. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. The idea is kenosis. He set aside his own will and prerogative. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the greatest and most marvelous work in all of history. right? That God Himself, Jesus, would come to the earth, to die, to live a perfect life that you and I could not live. You and I, know none of us are righteous. And he didn't want to. In his flesh, he did it out of love. He even prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
if there could be any other way. So stressed out that he's sweating drops of blood, right? If there could be any other way, and he goes to the cross and he prays, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus died in our place. He was your substitute. He was pierced for you so that you don't have to die for your sins. He took all of the wrath of God upon Himself. That is a marvelous work. That is the greatest work of the Lord God Almighty. Now check out the second stanza, if you will, of this. Stanza number two. They sing, Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. God's ways are just and true. And I think in the context of this, if you think about it, these martyrs are saying this because violence is about to happen on the earth, right? What they're saying is the judgment that is coming, these bowls that have been handed to these angels to be poured out to finish the wrath of God, it's not unfair in a sense. It's not unjust that he would do this. Just and true are his ways. You know, many people think that God is unfair. A lot of times if you try and share your faith with people or you talk to people around you, they're like, oh, God's not good. Why does God allow this? He's not fair. Then they sort of, you know, kind of blow it off and use it as an excuse, right? But these, this Scripture reminds us that God is just. To be just is to act rightly when it comes to what is fair and just and God's wrath is not unfair you know we hear anytime something happens you know in culture everybody's like screams for justice we act like we don't understand justice when it comes to God but then the first thing happens even right now hashtag justice for Johnny it's like what are we even like we all the judges of you know this court case going on but you think of in a, in a different way, in a different light. You know, there was a lady who was suffered human trafficking, and it's, you know, Tampa and Florida is a hub for this. Like, you know, when you think of the, this terrible sin of human trafficking, Nikki was a lady who has since moved, was involved here, has a ministry uh, for human tra- trafficking victims. She was 15 years old, and she was kidnapped. She had run away a little bit, I, I think, had gone, it was in the 70s. As her story goes, she was doing karaoke one night. She begins to be groomed by this older man in his 20s. She ends up being kidnapped, carried off to Indiana where she's locked in an attic for multiple years as a human trafficking victim, some 30, 40 times a day sometimes where she's being taken advantage of sexually, right? And you hear these stories, and there was, she was not the only person in the room, and just the way she describes it, the stench and the horrible, you know, being violated, and, you know, it's just to hear a story like that, and then you, and you think, yes, the pimps and the johns, and you hear this kind of story, you're like, put them in the darkest, solitary confinement of whatever prison that we have. It begins to make sense and click. There is a time for justice, Right? There is a time for the wrath of God. There is a time for punishment of people who do things wrong. You know, in comparison to God's holy law and God's holiness, you and I deserve the wrath of God in that sense. When you take God's holy commandments, just take His Ten Commandments, for example. Do not lie. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not covet. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. All of us, when we, when we meter ourselves with God's standard of holiness, we all fall terribly short. And every one of us should be an object of God's wrath and are an object of God's wrath apart from Christ. Apart from this collision right, of, of God's mercy with His justice in the Gospel. You know, when you add on top of the commandments. Even Jesus takes it even further. He says if anyone was to look at a person with lust, he's the same in heaven's eyes as an adulterer. If you have hatred in your heart, you're the same as a murderer. So all of us should be object of his wrath, and his wrath is not unfair. I want you to turn for a minute to what's been called by many people uh, the center of the Bible. Turn to Romans for, example, for a minute. 
It's a little bit complicated and uses a lot of big words, but you see this collision of his just wrath, his wrath along with his grace, God being just, but also the justifier. Romans chapter 3, if you can't understand the whole thing, it's okay. Let's just read it and, and just get, take what you can. But it says this, and you see this sort of collision, if you will, in the gospel, in Christ. Romans 3, 21 says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. That means a sacrifice, meaning He took the wrath upon Himself by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, he, passed, he has passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time, and then notice this, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So all of us, if God is just, we all deserve His wrath, but those who have faith in Jesus, who have trusted Christ as their Savior, are justified are forgiven. His blood, the blood of Christ, washes away sins for those who have faith in Jesus. And that's a beautiful thing, right? And you see this sort of collision. And the question is, who could possibly reject His grace? Who could possibly reject salvation through Christ? And that's the next stanza. And the question, right? Who will not fear O oh Lord, and glorify Your name. You could say it like this. Who would not repent of their sins and be forgiven and no longer be an object of God's wrath, but now be made right with God and have His favor and blessing upon your life? So that's stanza three in the question, who could possibly continue in unbelief? You know, it reminds me of a quote C.S. Lewis in his book, The Weight of Glory, he said this. He said, We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We all can understand that. If you've hung out with a toddler, you can present the, you know, like a five-year-old. You can present like Burns filet mignon, and you're like, take a bite. Like, no. They just want like bread, you know. It's like, you just want the free rolls? <laughs> like, we understand. They just, why won't you taste? And so often, you know, and the question is like, why do people just, you know, continue to reject the gourmet of the gospel for the, you know, for the fake, for the, the just cheap rolls of the sin and pride of the world? You know, to use a fishing illustration, it's like, why do dumb fish chase some plastic, soft plastic lure? You know, you throw out there, and it's like, they do. They eat it. They bite it. It's like, there's a whole school of mullet over here. Just go feast on it, right? Okay, well, that illustration works for me, but I, you know, it just doesn't make sense, right? Why would people just continue to reject God and to reject the forgiveness that offered through the gospel who would not glorify Him? You know, glorifying God is our life's mission. That's our life purpose. You know, I've always loved the, the, the phrase and the, the question from the Westminster Catechism. It says, what is the chief end of man? And the response is, well, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him always. And that is our life's mission through the great commandment to love God with all of our hearts, to walk with Him, to enjoy Him, to love others, to be a light to the world, to, you know, to walk with Him, to do great at our profession, to raise kids, to love our spouses, and to fear Him, right? to be good people. But when we ask that question, who will not fear God? The answer is, in our nation, most people. Right? Most people will not glorify God. 
You know, there was a time, and I was reminded of this recently, reading the story of George Whitfield. There was a time where our most famous American, the most famous American celebrity, if he had Instagram, he would have the most followers, you know, but George Whitfield was, I mean, 80% of America had gone to see George Whitfield preach. In the middle of the 18th century, late 1700s, right around the time that America was becoming a nation, a republic, a you're writing the Constitution, George Whitfield had sometimes Ben Franklin documented that he could preach up to up to 30,000 people without a microphone. That's how strong of a voice he was. You know, he really began to preach this message. It wasn't really in the churches so much, but he was a revivalist in a sense, and he was leveling the playing field. He was saying that we're all sinners, from the dirtiest of coal miners to the cleanest of the bougie, right? Like the bourgeoisie or whatever. We're all sinners. We all need repentance. And he was preaching the, the pure gospel and many people came to Christ. And you know, it was what had become known as the Great Awakening. And many preachers, Jonathan Edwards and John and Charles Wesley. And there was a great revival that happened. There was a time where most, the majority did at least fear God and have some type of Judeo-Christian values. Even those like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, you don't even think of, they're not, they weren't professing Christians, but there was a fear of God. Getting on a little bit of a tangent here, but we're living in a time now where that has, for the most part, fallen off. Right? And you think of our nation and how they wrote the Constitution. That's a great thing. Right? It's even given birth to the civil rights movement and equality amongst races. And it's, it was a mess. Yes. But we're living in a time again where most people do not fear God and bring Him glory. You know, as people reject God and, and continue to reject Him, the reality is that His wrath is just. When you think about the place that we're at now and the things that you see going on and the sort of corruption, there's a time where punishment is justified. When you think about biblically, the idea of confusing a child about their gender. You think of what God would say, what Jesus would say. I mean, when perverted people try to confuse kids about their gender and sexuality, it's right and just that they should have a millstone tied around their neck and to be thrown in the depths of the sea. Right? That is the, the fear of God. We don't do that. We don't mess with little children. It's right and just that they experience the bowls of God's wrath. Who will not fear God and give Him glory? You know, whoever doesn't repent and turn to Jesus, you will face the wrath of God. I pray there's not one person in here today that receives Jesus. What's up, guys? How's it going? <laughs> if you don't, have you not been made right with Christ, right? Don't, don't lay your head on the pillow tonight without being made right with God. He said, let the children come to me. It's okay. It's, I mean, we're good. We're not going to make them stumble. What's up, boys? We're almost done here. One more stanza this morning. Look at this, number four. Uh, he is, the verse goes like this, For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. He is worthy of our worship. Really, there's two parts to that. His righteous acts have been revealed. No one is without excuse, right? Romans, says, or Romans 1 says that. That God's righteousness, His gospel has been revealed. But people reject Him. People reject the gospel. They suppress the truth because they love sin more than they love God and the gospel more than they fear God. And they just continue on in their sin and God hands them over. And the wrath of God is justified but He's worthy of our worship. Great and marvelous is our God. And I pray that we live for His glory. I mean, is the song of these martyrs in your heart this morning, right? Are you living for His glory? Have you repented of your sins and been made right? His wrath will come. We will face judgment someday, whether we die first or whether we see Jesus come back. But he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy to be lived for our life, to be worshipped with our lives. Amen?
God, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you so much, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. God, we thank you for revealing uh, to us the gospel. I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, that today would be the day that they surrender, that they cry out to you, God. I pray that we would all be people who just pray and cry out to you and, and live for your glory and enjoy you, Lord, and walk with you. Thank you for the purpose of living for your glory that you've given us. God, we, we love you. We praise you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you can, let's stand together and uh, we'll get out of here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace and joy as you walk with him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.